So without further ado, I've been, I'm holding this meeting. It's beginning. So um, at the first order of business, um, I'd like to welcome all of you formally. I would like to welcome our veterans. Who are the veterans in the room? Look at, okay, thank you so much. Because you served, you, we, we, we get to be free. So thank you so much. Um, um, okay, I'd like to, without further ado, I'd like to invite up our new chaplain and Americanism chair. Her name is Barbara Witcher, and she's right up here. Our, our former chaplain, Ambrose Hung, had to retire and resign because he's got so many other professional things he's doing. He's a doctor, and he's trying to help our, with our, our um, health care in America, independent health care. So without further ado, Barbara, we're thrilled to have you. And would you like, is this a good, okay. Well, I have big shoes to fill because Ambrose did a great job, so I hope you'll bear with me. I'd like to get to know you all a little better, so I'm going to ask you if you are a grandparent, a grandma or grandpa, please raise your hands. Now, those of you that raised your hands, if any of you are great grandparents, raise those hands. And if some of you are great, great grandparents, raise those hands. Wow. Well, I happen to have 10 grandchildren and six great grandchildren, so if you have 72 hours you don't need filled, I'll be happy to tell you all about them. But uh, it is very obvious that we have a lot of brilliant, extraordinary, awesome children represented here today, don't we? And the reason that I wanted to know about your grandchildren was because our grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, are very definitely running the danger of not growing up and not becoming what we have enjoyed in this country. You know, all of us have lived through many, many elections, and they've been very bad sometimes, they've been very contentious, but never, ever in the history of our country, ever, have we had an election where the can one of set of candidates don't even want this country to be as it is now. They are determined to change our country. They call it getting it better. And that sounds wonderful. Better is always good. But the better they're talking about is not the better they really mean. The followers of them think better means improving things we still need improved upon. That's fine. But that's not what the elite are planning. They are planning on rewriting our Constitution and they are very definitely planning on eliminating much of our Bill of Rights, starting with the First and Second Amendments. They're already working on those. That's the freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom to gather, and of course, freedom to bear arms to protect ourselves. All of that is very much at stake here in this election. So, what are we going to do about it, guys and gals? Well, this is what we're going to do about it. We're going to put on our fighting gloves and we're going to get out there. We are all of us, I beg all of you, to get out of your comfort zones and work to get the election the way it needs to be to save our country. That means that we have to work with registering people. If they breathe, we can register them. If they need to, need to we're gonna get them out to, go, to do the voting. And on top of all of that, even more frightening, is we're gonna give you a way to talk to the loved ones that you have in your family and friends that are on that other side. And we're gonna tell them how to face reality and we're gonna do it in a way that you won't be afraid to have your head chopped off. <laughs> and there is another thing too that we can do, we've already alluded to this twice today, that is very, very important. And that is to talk to the one that gave us this beautiful country in the first place. So if you will, will you bow your heads with me as we will go to our Heavenly Father. Dear God, oh my goodness, God, here we are, concerned grandparents, concerned patriots. We need your help probably as we never have before in this nation to keep our people free, to make this a wonderful country for our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. So much, Lord, is at stake. You know all this. The, the, crazy, horrible inflation, the lack of law and order, 
the nutcase things that are going on in our, in our schools that we can't even imagine. But we need you, Lord. And yet we know, based on what you tell us in your wonderful holy book, that you also need foot soldiers. And that's where we come in, Lord. You know us all. You made us. You know who we are. You know our talents. You know our abilities. And oh yeah, you also know our, our elderly limitations. So we ask, Lord, as we hear the speakers, as we band together, as these next few months take place, that you speak to each and every one of us in our hearts and in our minds, Lord, and tell us what you would have us do to save our country. We are so grateful, Lord, that we have you as our God, that we can worship you in this beautiful land of ours. Amen. Thank you, Barbara. Wow, welcome, Barbara. That was what lovely. We're so glad to have you. Thank you. All right, so now our next, I want to introduce our keynote speaker today. Her name is Ruth. Oh, okay, now, isn't it great? My board really helps me. We need to do the Pledge of Allegiance, of course, God and country. Thank you. Okay, Carol. And Carol Blanchard's our former president. She's going to lead us. Thank you. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Okay, I'd like to bring up Ruth Weiss, and I want to read. We just had a little bio of her in our newsletter, and that's what I'm going to read. And I'm going to invite Ruth to add anything to it that I've maybe left out. And Ruth, as you see, she has her other assistants with her. So Ruth Weiss, she's a co-founder of the Election Integrity Project and Director of Legislative Oversight. She's a co-founder with Linda Payne. She's the daughter of an American history teacher and has always been patriotic American. For 34 years, Ruth gave her whole life to her high school students. And since retiring, she's continued to dedicate her activities to their future by working tirelessly to Election Integrity Project as a writer, speaker, and a trainer. The goal of Election Integrity Project of California is to defend the integrity of the voting process through research, observation, and documentation. They have been a pillar in our nation for wisdom over the last many years, maybe 12. So without further ado, and I will, I'll ask her to add to anything I might have mixed out, I want to give you Ruth Weiss. Whoa, what a view up here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that way I can, I know what I'm talking about, all right? I, I just, I feel like I have to defend myself for having been a, a high school teacher for 34 years because um, I was not one of the bad guys. <laughs> and if I were still teaching today, I'd get fired immediately. So, you know, I just, I can't even handle what's going on in, in education right now. And I defend my father because he was one of the people who taught from primary documents and taught real American history, and I was very proud of him for that. So um, I'm proud of what we did, but it's, it certainly can't be said <clears throat> about the situation in which we find ourselves today. So, <laughs> so thank you. It's nice to be back with you and to see such a full room. It's, it's delightful. I am uh, representing today the Election Integrity Project California. We are, I think it's important to let you know, a nonpartisan uh, organization. We're a 501c3 public benefit corporation. We are uh, dedicated to defending through education, research, and advocacy the civil rights of U.S. citizens to be involved in their own electoral process. I think one of the things that's happened in the last three, four, or five generations is that we have forgotten that there is not a distinction between we the people and the government. We've gotten to, to thinking about the government as an entity that's separate from us. And that's how a country dies. That's how a republic dies. And we are not a democracy, because then it really would die fast. We're a republic, and we, the people, are the government. We just have to reawaken ourselves to that process and go, oh, OK, if we are the government, we get to take it back over again. And we have to remember that the government can't do anything to us that we don't choose to allow them to do to us. So there we go. Um, <clears throat> but a lot of you in this room are in the middle 
of fighting a lot of battles. You may be doing it simply by reading and bemoaning or praying or by going to discussion groups or listening to the radio. You might be doing it by actually getting out and collecting signatures on petitions or fighting or belonging to a group. Whatever you are doing, there are a lot of battles out there to fight today the way our society is going. And every single one of those battles is there to be fought because of the decisions that have been made by our elected officials and then the bureaucrats that they appoint. If we had the right officials and the right bureaucrats, we'd have far fewer battles to be fighting, is that right? Well, whose job is it to select those people? Ours, of course, okay? All of these battles that we're fighting are brush fires, and they're getting lit faster than we can put them out. And so that we're, we're running around and being kept busy, stamping out a fire here, stamping out a fire there, stamping out a fire over there, parental rights, uh, health choice rights, uh, First Amendment rights, Second Amendment rights, you know, you name it. But all of these fires are ignited by the, the laws and regulations that are the sparks that, that ignite all those fires. And so we have so many of those fires that it proves that we have an election integrity problem. Why? Well, because we're not stupid. The whole point of a democratic process that underlies our republic is that if we like the decisions of the people who are in office, we reelect them. If we do not like their decisions, we vote them out. That's what has kept this country for over 200 years from, from needing to have a more violent type of revolution, because we have one every two years at the ballot box. However, if all these people that nobody likes continue to get reelected, then the problem is not we the people in our sense of judgment. The problem is with the election process. There's something wrong. And that's why Election Integrity Project was founded, because we knew there was something wrong. So we wanted to get into the middle of it and find out what it was that was wrong and then fix it. And we're still in that process, obviously. But to stop all those fires, we've got to neutralize the arsonists. While you're fighting all those fires, that's important, but they count on those fires keeping you so busy, you don't have time to realize that the arsonist is the problem, right? So we have to re-legitimize re the ballot box. We have to make elections work again. And it's getting more and more difficult to do that because as people, time after time, vote and go away discouraged, Pretty soon, they're starting to say, ah, oh, why bother? Why should I even bother to vote? Doesn't make a difference. Does it, you know, you hear this around you ever? Some of you don't admit it. Some of you are thinking it yourselves. You know you are, okay? So in order to stop the fires, we've got to restore and then defend election integrity once we get it back. And that will win us the war. Now, EIPCA has been around for now 12 years. And we know this business. And the reason I bring that up is that after 2020, everybody in the country finally woke up to the fact that there's an election integrity problem. And so everybody started diving into it. Oh, let's start an election integrity arm of this organization, that organization. The, remember, you see it happening everywhere? Well, a lot of these people and a lot of these organizations have a lot of, of notoriety. They have um, big microphones. They have big names. Everybody knows who they are. They do really good work. And so everybody's going, oh, good, finally, they're going to get election integrity. But the problem is they don't know what we know because they haven't been in it for 12 years. And they're trying to do things that we tried and, and failed at 12 years ago. They're promising you things they can't fulfill, not because they mean to lie to you, but because they don't know. So we want you to think about who you're going to listen to, who you're going to support, who you're going to get behind in the field of election integrity. Just like you do in any other walk of life, you're going to hire the experts. And I would just put before you today that we'd like you to take a look at us for that. We have three basic programs. One is our research program, or all three research programs, sorry. The first one is our citizen observer program, which I'll talk a little bit more about uh, later, but it's very important. We have trained and deployed over 17,000 people, just like all of you sitting right here, to know how to go out and observe. You've probably heard a lot about observing in the last few years. 
as you know, in 2020, observers were kept out of some places and that kind of stuff. You know, oh, observers, yes. So you've probably heard some of these people that are jumping in with two feet into election integrity are saying, well, get out there and observe. But my question to you is, if you're not trained and you don't know what you're looking for, what good are you doing? Not very much. So we're the only program that has a training program in the entire state. We are the only organization that has a training program that shows you what to look for, what to do when you see it, and supports you so that you don't ever have to be the bad guy. Well, that's a pretty good deal. We have our documentation from our observers, which is the best in the nation. And I'm saying that not as my opinion or EIPCA's opinion, but the opinion of some attorneys like J. Christian Adams and stuff who, who know what we do and will, will sing our praises because we're the only organization that we're aware of in the entire country who are collecting our documentation under penalty of perjury, which makes it court worthy, which allows us to do something with it besides just tattletale, right? Every other organization is, you know, they take your documentation online or you can write them a note or whatever, and that's absolutely useless when you really want to do something with it. And the reason that we, are, we have won two lawsuits and have two more that we intend to win is because we have that documentation that no one else is collecting in this country. Our observers are trained to monitor a lot of things. Ballot processing, because like Stalin is supposed to have said some version of this quote, it's not who votes but who counts the votes that matters. And so when we, are, we are down there watching what they're doing every step of the way, making sure that every ballot is handled properly, respectfully, that things don't happen that would manipulate. We uh, obviously monitor the in-person voting at polling locations, but we also now are encouraging people to help us out by monitoring drop boxes and the way that ballots get transported. There's a lot of things to watch. And so we try to show you at whatever level of involvement that you're able to be involved in, we show you how to do that. We also have a voter roll research program because everybody likes to talk about the voter rolls and we gotta clean up the voter rolls. And believe me, it is not an easy task and until we change two very significant federal laws, it's gonna be very tough to clean up any voter rolls uh, at all. However, we did file a lawsuit uh, in 2017 and hired Judicial Watch to be our attorneys. And in 2019, we got a settlement on that lawsuit. We were able to remove uh, 1.5 million registrations in Los Angeles County alone that were obsolete and needed to come off the voter rolls. In addition, that lawsuit made another 1.5 million people on the LA County active rolls get moved to the inactive rolls in preparation to get finally removed, and then it also caused the Secretary of State to have to change the way that every registrar in all 58 counties cleans the voter rolls and, and works. Now, that was a drop in the bucket, but it shows you that with enough perseverance, you can accomplish something. We also have a, a program that tries to examine our, our state and federal laws. Not only the ones that are in existence, but we try to watch the ones that the legislatures are, uh, you know, bringing forth to try to pass, and boy, they are stuffing laws down our throats like, like crazy, as you're well aware. And so we try to look at those, we, we go up, we talk to them in Sacramento, we testify at the committee meetings, we do everything we can to try to stop the worst of the worst of the worst from getting through, even in this very unbalanced environment we have in California. And we are very successful, and I have to take the time to tell you this story. When in 2020, the decision was being made to mail out a vote by mail ballot to every single person in the, on, the, on the voter rolls, every eligible voter. We knew we weren't gonna stop that, even though it really needed to be stopped. But we also noticed that the wording did not distinguish between active voters and inactive voters. Because if you're on the inactive voter list, you're still eligible to vote, and so it, without any uh, state not requiring any ID of any kind, anybody could grab a name off the inactive list and vote in that person's name. It would have been as easy as making a phone call and saying, hey, send me a ballot. Here's the address. So those voters were of concern, especially since now we weren't even going to have to make the phone call. We were just going to mail them out to all those addresses that don't exist anymore. So we spoke at the committee hearing, and one of the 
silver linings in the cloud of COVID is that because they could no longer hold in-person meetings and let the public come, we were all allowed to come by phone, which means we didn't have to travel to Sacramento, which very few people have time and energy to do. So we were able to sit in our own living rooms and make the phone call be online. And once you're on the line, you are allowed to give, to give your name, where you're from, what organization you may be associated with if you are, and your position on the bill. We had over 900 people call in that day because we got the word out and people like yourselves came forth and you called and every and we had proposed an amendment to that bill. We said, look, you've got to change the wording to say that these ballots are only going out to the active list because otherwise somebody may send to the inactive list which say, oh no, that would never happen. No, no, you got to change the words because you know what? They passed exactly the same law in, in Nevada and the, the, the registrar of the largest county in Nevada that encompasses Las Vegas did send a ballot to everybody on the inactive list as well. So if you don't change the wording of this law, it can and will happen. And that was our amendment. So now all of these 900 people got on one at a time and they hated us. Oh, they hated us. They didn't want to sit there listening. But all of those people said, we are opposed to this bill unless you adopt the amendment from EIPCA. It got amended. And you know how many ballots did not get mailed to deceased and relocated people as a result? Four and a half million ballots that would have gone out in an atmosphere of unrestricted ballot harvesting. It could have been a lot worse. So, you know, you can do something even from behind. Um, but our, we never look at voter fraud because that isn't just, it's a legal term, it's something that's very hard to prove, it's hard to catch, but what we're looking at is election corruption. We're looking at the corruption of the system because if any system of any kind has integrity, it means it, that it has no leaks, Nobody, nothing can get through. So if we can return integrity to our system, then it doesn't matter how many people are out there trying to commit fraud, it will be unsuccessful. So we focus on the integrity of the system and the, re, the return to that. But by 2014, we began to realize because of the passage of all these laws, which we allege to be highly intentional, it became really easy to manipulate the process and for people who knew how to do it to exploit the uh, vulnerabilities in the system. And who was exploiting? Well, the people who put them there in the first place, right? So um, we have a document on our website I invite you to go take a look at. It's called the Golden State Agenda, and it's just a bullet point list of, of chronology of some of the major laws that have been passed, and you start to see how they tie together and start to, to tighten the noose around the neck of the voters of the state of California. Really important to see this, because one at a time, those laws look pretty innocent. One at a time, they kind of look like maybe that's a good idea. You put them all together, and then you realize you've been hoodwinked. Um, so we would like you to take a look at that. And they did it by increasing registration which is a good thing, but not worrying about whether those getting registered were eligible or not. That's the bad thing. And they not only didn't worry about it, they incentivized people who weren't eligible to vote in the state of California to get registered and vote by putting into the law, oh, if you get registered um, by mistake or if you just get registered and you shouldn't be, you know, we, we will not prosecute you, we will not hold you accountable for that. We're, the state will take the blame. So they completely exculpated everybody, right? And then the second thing these laws have done is, is to um, disrupt the chain of custody of the ballots. And you know how important that is. If you don't know that what the chain of custody is and you don't know how many times it's been waylaid or changed or even permanently lost before it got where you intended it to go as a voter. So they've created a what, what we're calling a Gordian knot, which is a legendary knot from Greek mythology that in the legend was nobody could solve the riddle. But if anybody could solve the riddle, they would get to rule the world. Somebody did solve the riddle. Anybody remember who? Alexander the Great, the boy wonder. Did he rule the world? Yeah, he did. He ruled the known world of his time. But the way he solved that riddle is he just took out his sword and cut it in half. It says you can't untie it, you have to cut it in half. Well, that's the same thing now with the laws that have been created in the state of California over the last 25 years. So EIPCA has filed a federal lawsuit, and that's our sword to cut through these laws. Because what we're saying is these laws 
are unconstitutional on the basis of four constitutional clauses, and we intend to prove it, and our documentation intends to prove it. And as a result, we expect this to go to the Supreme Court, and we expect to get ruling in our favor, which means that California is going to have to abandon all of those unconstitutional laws and start over with a system that is not only constitutional, but integral. What do you think? Yeah. Okay. We're currently on appeal in the Ninth Circuit. Um, our hearing is the 23rd of September. And so sometime after that, we'll get the ruling, which will either mean we'll go back to the federal court and get to start doing all the, the stuff that we want to do with the lawsuit, or we'll get to appeal directly to the Supreme Court. I don't know how to tell you which way to pray. I don't know which decision would be better. So I'm just going to ask you to please actively pray for the very best outcome for the people of the state of California and their civil rights. Whichever direction the Lord wants that to go, make it happen and pray for protection of our attorneys and all of us in the IPCA along the way, because we are in a spiritual battle and we are very much under attack. I wanted to say, Barbara, you gave my whole speech. I could have just gone to Q&A. You are phenomenal, but everything she said, double, triple, quadruple, she was fabulous. Yes, please. Now, this agenda that I've been talking about, it does have a heart. Right in the middle of that Gordian knot, there's a beating heart. And if that beating heart were not there, the rest of it would kind of shrivel up and die. And this is where some of you might get, wait a minute, no, don't talk about this. I just want you to look at something from another direction, from a way that maybe you've looked at it in the past. I'm not trying to ruffle feathers here. But the beating heart is a scheme called voting by mail. And I intentionally call it a scheme because this is the way they most often are able to manipulate the results of elections. So think about it, think about it. it. It's the number one tool for fraud in the nation, the vote by mail vote. Now, that's not me saying that, and that's not EIPCA saying that. This is every expert in, in the field of election integrity that you can talk to, and it is the results of two presidential commissions that did a really deep dive into voting by mail in the United States of America. And that's a conclusion they came to. And a lot of other states said, oh, okay, then we'll limit it only to the people who really need it. And California said, tool for fraud, cool, give me some of that. And you've seen what's happened since then. Now that they've decided they're gonna mail a ballot to everybody, they've now decided to say that California is an all vote by mail state. And that's a flat out lie because every single person in the state of California still has a right to vote in person. We're all gonna get a ballot. That doesn't mean we have to use it the way they want us to. So please keep that in mind. You are not forced to vote by mail. Please let everybody else know that. When you, what we recommend is voting in person. We've recommended voting in person since day one because we've always known it was safer. Voting in person doesn't mean taking your ballot, putting it in an envelope, and then taking it and dropping it off in person. You've still voted by mail. If you turn in your ballot in an envelope, you have voted by mail. But when you go out vote in person, you go directly to a polling place. And you walk in and you surrender that vote by mail ballot and say, I don't want to use this. I want to use a real ballot today. And you vote right there in person. Okay, why would you want to do that? Because it gets marked, it goes into a box, it goes to the counting center the same day, it gets counted the same day. No opportunity for anybody to lose it, damage it, or manipulate it. It's safe. It is as safe, secure, and fast. You know, we are a laughing stock in this country because we're the only state that takes 30 days to figure out who won our elections. 30 days after election day, by that point, none of us care anymore. The rest of the country's going, just laughing at us. Why is that so? Because of the manipulation of the whole system and the complexity of the system and the number of vote by mail ballots that we allow in this state. When you turn in an envelope ballot, here's what happens. You can turn it in in so many ways people are confused. You can take it to the registrar's office. You can give it to a trusted third party to turn in for you. You can take it to a polling location to turn it in or go to an official drop box. 
And the ones on the top are, are fairly safe if you're going to insist on voting that way, but that drop box needs to be staffed. How many staffed drop boxes do you have here in Orange County? Zero. All your drop boxes are sitting out 24 7, unmonitored, unsurveilled, and don't get emptied for, every, for 92 hours. They don't have to get emptied except every 92 hours. Or is it 96 hours? One of those two. Is that where you want your ballot? Really? You want it in a drop box that may not be emptied for 92 or 96 hours, sitting there vulnerable. I don't want my ballot there, okay? But if it's staffed and emptied daily, yeah, but that's not what we have. Um, then you can put in a drop box that, that somebody has uh, developed for a ballot harvesting, but then you, know, you really have to trust that organization and those people. You can put it in official drop box unstaffed, the ones I was just talking about, or you can send it through the mail. Notice that as we get farther down the list, these are the lesser safe ways to turn in your ballot. See where U.S. Postal Service is? It's total chaos. I'm not going to put my ballot there. And then, of course, giving it to a random ballot harvester that knocks on your door and says, hi, I'm here to collect your ballot. Of course, that would really be the worst thing to do. Um, sorry. Um, but then once it gets, let's assume your ballot gets where it's going. Now, they don't just rip it open and count it. There's the problem. People don't know that. This is what it goes through, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. John likes to talk about it being a 12-step process, and I think it is at least that, okay? But it has to be inspected and scanned and sorted and imaged and then verified and signature verification is a complete and total joke because of the new regulations from the Secretary of State. Any signature is going to get through. Trust me on that. Any signature is going to get through, which means you can steal anybody's ballot, sign it any way you want to. It's going to get through. So you don't have that protection, okay? Then they have to open it and extract it and inspect it for damage. And if they decide your ballot's damaged, it goes to a pile to be copied over. And they have encouraged you to use this new remote access vote by mail. How many of you have heard of that? Oh, good. I'm glad you haven't. Because your, your Secretary of State and your Governor both came out and said, oh, everybody should vote this way. We've made it available to everybody now. It was a system developed to help people with visual handicaps and to help people who are, are stationed you know, in the middle of the boonies or halfway around the world. But now they decided all of us get to vote that way, and it's where they email your ballot to you. And you mark it on your computer, and then you put it in an envelope and send it in. Yeah. But every single one of the remote access vote by mail ballots is a damaged ballot because it's printed on your paper. and It's not printed in such a way that the tabulator can read it. So all of those go to recopy. Now you begin to wonder why are they encouraging you to vote that way? Because how do these things get recopied? By two random individuals with little to no supervision in the registrar's office and then that's the ballot that's counted in your name. I'm feeling pretty queasy about all that situation and that's what happens when you put your ballot in an envelope, okay? And then it goes through adjudication sometimes and then ultimately tabulation. So I know a lot of us are concerned about the machines, but that's just one small thing. And believe me, not all the machines are compromised. You know, the compromising of the machines, and we don't deny that that's happening, but it's very small because it, it's too difficult to do. So it's only for really important races in certain key spots in the US of A. Right now, those tabulators are not as, as evil as some of us may think. But what is evil is this whole process I've just described. As your ballot goes through hundreds of hands and hundreds of vulnerable moments. So what are you going to do? What can you do? Okay, first of all, get our emails. We don't send them out real often, but we give you valuable information, like you know, some of the stuff you're hearing today, and ways to help you know how to vote and protect your vote, and protect the vote of the people around you. So go right there to eip-ca.com and sign up to receive our emails. That's your first plan of action here that, you, that everyone needs to do. And then secondly, because of getting information from us, you're gonna know more about your rights, and then considering your civic duties. We published a series of articles called Vote Safe 2022, just one page articles um, that we sent out to people prior to the primary election, just giving them good information about, you know, advice on how to vote, what not to do, what to do, et cetera. Please go and read those. They're still posted front and center on the, on the um, 
on the website, and they're also just as, as um, valuable leading into the general election. Just go take a look at them and start to know a little bit more about how to keep your vote and everybody else's vote safe. And then some of you might want to consider applying to become a county elections worker. If you have the time and the energy to do that, you could pick up a few bucks. They play, pay pretty well now. And to do that, you simply go to the website of your registrar of voters here in this county and just fill out an application. If you do that, you'd be working two to four months, some of you part-time, some of you the full-time, and then you'll be doing some of those things and everything else that has to be done during election time when they bring in the temporary workers. If that's too much for you, maybe you would like to staff the polling locations, which are now called vote centers, always changing the vocabulary. Um, you would staff those vote centers and you would help transport ballots. So maybe that's something you could do. That's a commitment somewhere from two to 15 days. Because now you get to vote how many days? 11. You have 11 days of in-person voting. It's ridiculous. Total waste of taxpayer money and everything else. But it also means if you go one of the first eight or nine days, you'll be the only one there. You will not wait in line. You'll walk in, vote, walk out. You know, really piece of cake. So it's, you know, it has its bright spots. And then, of course, if that's too much for you, you can become a trained EIPCA observer. Now you can train to observe at the registrar's office where they're counting and processing all of those ballots, which is really important to keep our eye on. You have to be able to stand for 20 to 30 minutes at a time, so some of you may not want to commit to that. But if you, if you uh, become an observer at the polling locations, it's one where you walk in and sit down. So virtually everybody could do that. Um, if you are going to observe the ballot processing, it's a 60-day period of time where they're processing ballots. Starts 29 days before Election Day, finishes 30 days after Election Day. And so you could pick and choose your dates, your times, the amount of times you go, everything within 60 days. Certainly you can find a little bit of time in, within a two-month period of time to go do that. And if you're going to observe a polling location, you've got now a lot of different days, a lot of different places, a lot of different hours that you could go and, uh, and observe. And again, all of that as a volunteer is completely your choice. We don't command you to be there at a certain date and time. You just tell us what, what and when and where and with whom. And keep in mind, we give you hotline support. So you're there to see what's going on to ask a couple of important questions if it seems appropriate, and then if the, the problem doesn't get resolved, you just step outside and call us and we'll do the heavy lifting. So it's not, it's not an intimidating job or anything. And of course, we have with us here today almost the whole Orange County coordination team. That's really exciting. We have Catherine Gerdes down here in front. Well, she, we all introduced ourselves to you a few minutes ago, so you know who we are and we're around here. Um, and they would love to have more people. This is a big county. They would love to have more people helping them. So maybe if you want a little bit more long-term involvement that way, you could talk to them about joining their team and becoming part of the coordination team. We need all of these things. So whether you just want to work as a support staff individual or you want to really take charge and be one of the top dogs, there's spots all along the way. And the purpose of a coordination team in a county is you're going to educate your county and your community, sometimes in large groups and sometimes just one in one, of about EIPCA and some of the problems with the electoral process. You're going to recruit people to join the observation team when elections come. And then the team together coordinates and facilitates the training and, the, um, and supports the observers when they're out there. So we need you also, if you do nothing else, is to spread the word. That's something else you can do. Spread the word because voter ignorance is the problem. None of this gets taught to us anywhere, right? And mostly they're trying to keep this information away from us. They don't want us to know all this stuff. So you can start spreading what you know based on the stuff that you're reading on our website, et cetera, and tell everybody else what they need to know. That'll be a big help if you could just simply help us educate. And I think this is the most important slide in this whole presentation because of how depressed and down and discouraged people are, or angry or cynical. And we need to turn that around and remind everybody, no, we're the government. If we don't like what the government's doing, let's become the government we want to see. Let's do more, not less. So spread that hope. 
Because if we get out the vote, if more people vote, if more people who believe the way we do, that this country is constitutional and based on a, on a, on a Judeo-Christian uh, morality system, we will see some of that stuff, those brush fires we're fighting, go away. But you have to get in and, and we have to encourage everybody to go. Friends don't let friends sit out any election, okay? We can still outvote whatever fraud manipulation is going on there, and the main way to do it is by voting in person. I'll bring up Arizona. It appears that Carrie Lake is gonna win that election. What was her number one message to all of her supporters every time she spoke to her supporters during her campaign? Please vote in person. Please vote in person. That was her message to her supporters, and they did, and as a result, there were fewer ballots to be manipulated in the state of Arizona, and it appears that she has pulled out that victory. So there's the message right there. Vote in person, help other people do the same by telling them why they should, offering them a ride to the poll. Hey, let's go together, we'll vote, because you can vote anywhere in the county you want to. Let's go vote and then let's go to our favorite restaurant and celebrate the fact that we're free. Um, in Orange County, all you do when you show up is, well, before you go to vote, you mark your sample ballot so you know how you wanna vote. And then you take that blank vote by mail ballot with you as well to the, to the vote center and take your envelope. Now, I don't think you have to surrender it in Orange County. However, I ask you to take it with you because if something were to happen, they have a technological glitch, and they go, oh, I'm sorry, you've already voted. Or, you go, or they say, um, um, I don't think you're registered, we don't find you here. How you react is really important. You don't just go, oh, okay, I'll vote provisionally. Ah, that's another envelope. No, you simply have some magic words to say, which I'll tell you in a minute. So that's why you want that with you, because then you can hold it up and say, no, clearly I'm, a, I'm registered, and clearly I have not voted, so let's talk this over. That's why you take that with you. And then you surrender that ballot in your county. It's, a, it's an electronic surrender, which means you don't have to hand it over. But they will mark you as having voted in person so that you can't use the vote by mail ballot too and vote twice. They'll do that electronically. And then you just simply ask to vote in person, they will issue you a ballot, you will mark it, you will turn it in, it'll get counted that day. It's very simple. And you've got all those vote centers to do it at, and like I said, in the first 10 days, nobody else is there but you, practically. The magic words, please call your hotline. Memorize those, say them right now. Oh, you can do better than that. Please call your hotline. So if, if anything were to happen, oh, I'm sorry, I think you've already voted. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't find your name in the list. You say, you know what, I know this is a, just a technological glitch. It's not your fault. Could you please get a supervisor? And if the supervisor doesn't solve it, you say, would you please call your hotline? Every poll worker has a hotline to call. And at the registrar's office, they'll walk you through and they will find the problem and you will get to vote the way you want to vote. So you don't get mad, you fully fix the halo, you be nice and polite, because those people working the polls are just like you, they're just normal people doing a job that sometimes is way over their head. And so we help them through and ultimately, we all can be friends at the end. Don't get mad, don't get cynical, don't yell and scream, just say, no, there's an error here, let's fix it. Please call your hotline. Those are those magic words. And then be a part of overwhelming this agenda again by saying nope to the envelope, because together, if we all do this, you're gonna see a big difference. Thank you. <laughs> Catherine and, and, and Nancy and, and John and I can take donations today, you can go online and you can click the donate button on our website. You can either donate then online with a credit card or you can, on that same button, they will give you an address to which you can send a check if you prefer that. And I thank you for mentioning that because it's hard to ask people for money, especially these days, but, that, but um, lawsuits are not cheap. And you know, even though right now we have an attorney working with us who is a public interest law firm, so it's not gonna be as expensive as it could be, 
there's just a lot of court fees and a lot of things to pay for. And if we get to the point where we get to do the audits we're trying to do, you have to pay the professional auditors, et cetera. So we do need financial support too. So if you can help us there, if you know any uh, individuals or organizations that give larger donations or maybe uh, grants, put us in touch with that as well. Uh, but consistent, generous giving is gonna help us get through this all together. So thanks for mentioning that. Kath uh, Catherine? Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, in order to get in on our training and observe for this election, there is a cutoff date for filing your papers with us um, just for, for the purpose of our being able to make sure that we've got everything you know, in line. And that deadline for applying online and filling out the couple of papers we ask you to fill out and get them postmarked no later than September 3rd. Now, please don't wait till then. In fact, Nancy's back there with a connection to the internet. If you want to go and do it right now online and get yourself in the queue, you can do it with Nancy before you walk out of here today. Otherwise, go to eip-ca.com slash volunteer and just follow the instructions. It's very simple, but we need to get you on the spreadsheet and then all that information will go to the Orange County team and they'll reach out to you and say, Welcome aboard. These are the days and times and places we're having our trainings. Where would you like to show up? So thanks for asking that, Catherine. Um, okay. A few uh, questions here. First of all, there are some people who may not be capable of getting down or having someone get to the polls. So obviously, they would have to mail it in. Correct. If they mail it in, they could either go to the post office or a drop box. Post office would be better than a drop box, of course. And also, um, um, individuals, when they go down to the polling place, uh, I assume they can also vote not only on paper, but electronically, right? In this county, can you, do you have that choice to vote electronically as well as on paper? Do you have voting machines? Okay, so apparently when you go to, because it's different in every county, and I'm from San Diego, so when you go to the polls, here in this county, you could either ask for a paper ballot or you can use the machine to cast your vote. And you recommend the paper oh, ballot? Oh, wait a minute. Now I'm being told we don't have machines. Okay, so I'm being told now you only use paper ballots in Orange County. And then after, yeah, you send it through a scanner. Okay. That's what they say, yeah. The, um, the people who cannot get to the polls for whatever reason while they're open are the people that the vote by mail ballot is, was originally designed for. It's essential that we have that option for people to use to vote. But if only the people who really needed it were the ones using that option, then we would have clean elections. Up till 1962, we only had fewer than 3% of our people needing an absentee ballot. Now in 2020, they were able to cajole up to 87% of Californians to vote that way, and that's why we have the problem. So those who can vote other than by mail should try to consider do it that way, and then that leaves the option for those people who cannot get to the polls to vote by mail. Yeah, they make that distinction, absentee ballot as opposed to mail-in ballot. California does not have an absentee ballot. Not anymore. Yeah. No. Uh, since 1998, because an absentee ballot is when you apply for each and every election you need it, and you verify who you are and where you live, and, and, and that keeps things clean. We don't have an absentee ballot anymore. We, we have a, a permanent vote by mail ballot, which is fraught with all kinds of complications. Yeah. Great information. There's so much that we didn't know that we didn't know. So I have one, I would love to share this with friends and relatives in other states. Is it available, EIP? Well, um, I know your club is recording this. What do you do with your recordings? So the vil you'll be able to get it through the it'll, villagers? It'll go on working. YouTube. Okay, so that's one way. Um, we haven't put anything out from ourselves yet, mainly because you know things keep changing. Uh, you know, from 
from day to day to day, there's new information. But um, also, I just did a recording yesterday uh, for a national organization where a lot of the same information was shared as a warning to other states to not go down the same path that California went down. And there, they have a, a library, um, a digital library that anybody can go in and play the recording anytime they want to. And I can try to get the information on how to reach that to you. And that would be another way for you to get it. So EIP, as an organization, is available in other states? Um, no, we have uh, EIP Arizona, and we have EIP Nevada, and a defunct EIP, um, uh, what was the other state? <laughs> Arkansas, but uh, they're, you know, they're, they're on hold at the moment. But there are election integrity organizations in other states that are not EIP, but they are, like there's a Defend Florida, there, you know, in, in a lot of states. And we, we work with them, we, not work with them, but we share best practices, we stay in touch with them, we network with them. Um, but then there are some states completely unrepresented at this point uh, by an organization like ours. So, um, But yeah, the, the concern is nationwide, of course, and more and more people are wanting to figure out how to, how to do this. So. In the back. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes, we do. Yes. Um, let me know or let one of the Orange County people know and we will put you in touch with speakers from LA County. Uh, LA County is also a vote center county. Uh, the process is very similar in LA to, to the way it is in Orange. So. Yeah, definitely. We'll be happy to come. Yes. Oh, so I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're next. That he was calling on somebody else. Go ahead. When I was in Los Angeles County, and we brought to the registrar voters about six um, fraud um, voters that were not um, citizens that were voting. The uh, registrar just didn't listen to us and will not do the investigation. I now, um, because our church is doing voter registration, we have information that there are a couple of buildings of legal residents but non-citizens. And they were given the, um, they were mailed the mail-in ballots. Um, is there an organization where I can turn some of these numbers in for someone to do the investigation? I wish there were. Um, in California has made it impossible to find out ahead of time or after the fact whether someone is eligible to vote or not on the basis of citizenship. Um, there is an actual law in the state of California that elections officials up to and including the Secretary of State cannot access the databases that keep citizenship information, like the DMB and the other social service organizations. And they are forbidden for sharing that information. So the very people who are supposed to, to verify the eligibility of an individual before they get on the voter rolls have no access to citizenship information by law in the state of California. So that has to change. That's a law we have to overturn. But that's how corrupt they've gotten, and then they pass the laws that, that register you automatically when you interact with all of these government agencies. And those agencies, according to that law, even though they know your citizenship status, are forbidden from letting that influence. They have to upload your information to the Secretary of State regardless of citizenship because it's automatic now. So I mean, this is what California has done, like I said, to you know, blur the lines and uh, so we need, to, we need to get them to change that law. You need to sit down with your state legislators because I will guarantee you your state legislators do not know this information. They do not know that those laws exist. They do not lo know that there's no way to determine somebody's citizenship eligibility. They don't know this. You need to share this with your legislators and say, you need to get on the war path to change this because your legislators have no clue. Half the time when they're voting on, on a bill, they haven't read it, right? They're just told by their party whip, vote this way, and they do. But they don't know what's in, in the legislation, and, and so they have no idea it's there. Uh, 
I'd like to congratulate you on your presentation and Thank your you. effort. How large of an organization is EIPCA? It's very difficult to answer that question uh, in terms of the, at the top. Um, <clears throat> we have a board of, I think, five people who are all wearing six or eight hats. We need more help. Um, our list of active coordinators on the coordination teams is 60 to 70. And then, as I said, we've trained over 17,000 people to, to observe throughout the state. So I don't know on what base, you know, we don't have memberships or anything like that, so it's kind of hard to, to quantify how big we are. Um, it's a matter of how hard we work, and it's a matter of the impact we're having. I'm reminded of the Stalin quote about, I don't care who votes, mm -hmm. I just want to count the votes. Mm -hmm. And in the 2020 election, it was obvious that there was a lot of fraud. Mm -hmm. I am told further that there were 70 judicial challenges to the fraud that obviously went on, and yet not one court case was able to find that fraud and carry it further? Now, the reason for that is that none of, none of that evidence was ever allowed to be heard. And the reason is that all of those lawsuits filed after 2020 had one thing in common. They were seeking to overturn a national presidential election. That's just not going to happen without a civil war. And no court was willing to go down that road, including the Supreme Court when they were appealed to by a 17-state group led by Texas to say, we want you to look at this. So every single one of those court cases was rejected on the basis of what they call standing. Standing means you don't have the right to file this lawsuit. And there's a, there's a, you qualify because of harm and things like that. And the courts, in some cases, particularly the Supreme Court decision to turn down the, the state's appeal, um, turned it down on the basis of standing when they clearly had standing. That's a requirement that the Supreme Court hear a lawsuit brought by states, but they said, no, you don't have standing. And so none of the evidence, which is abounds out there, and it's still out there, but none of it was allowed to be heard because they wouldn't even start the lawsuits. That's why ours is different. It doesn't seek to overturn an election. It looks toward the future to try to change the electoral process to something that's more constitutional for future elections by looking at the evidence that what we have now is unconstitutional without overturning anything in the past. You'll never overturn an election like that because there was fraud. But you can use that to make sure it doesn't happen again, and that's what happened. But there are a lot of lawsuits out there making their way, and a lot of evidence is now being heard, and it's every day. I get three, four more emails about, okay, this happened today in this state, and this happened today. So it's still there, and it's still coming out. It just wasn't going to happen between November and January of 2020, which wasn't going to happen. Who gets to be the last? Okay. For voter ID, uh, we've heard a lot of conversation that that seems to get a little media attention, but then disappears. Voter ID is wildly popular among every group you can name in the United States. 70 to 80 percent approval for voter ID. But the legislature doesn't want to solve the issue, so they won't bring it up. There was um, an attempt at an ID law that the EIPCA was supportive of, and we were collecting petitions, but if you don't have a three to five million dollar treasure chest before you start a petition drive, it will never make it to the ballot, and we didn't have that money, so it failed. If it were to make the ballot, it would pass. Getting it on the ballot, though, is the issue, and so, again, this is something you need to be in constant contact with your state legislators and just bombard them, you know, politely, but say, look, we need voter ID, we need voter ID. However, when you've got, you know, between 60 and 80 percent of the people sending in an envelope ballot, there's only so much voter ID can do. I and mean, how, how do you verify who sent that ballot in? So we also have to return to voting mostly in person if, if an ID law is really going to make a big difference here in California. Thank you so much for being here and for having such a wonderful group and for letting me talk. Thank you. Thank you so much.